Well, amen, amen. Well, good to be saved. Amen. Good to be in church. Yeah. Good to see me. Yes. It better be good to see me because I can't see you. I'm telling you, you could be doing ugly faces right now. You just, you're just, I got a 747 landing right here. I'll probably be more suntan after the service. But um, I, well, this, uh, this was the second book I wrote, the answer book. And uh, it was, I think it came out in 1989. I had to cover 62 charges against the King James Bible. Uh, just to cover a few, is Easter a mistranslation in our English Bible? Uh, what do we do about the archaic words? Was King James a homosexual? He was not. There is no historic. In fact, the guy was a man's man. He really was. Um, he was bow-legged. And, so, and he loved to hunt. So he would make them tie him to a horse so he wouldn't fall off. And then went out next to Edinburgh Castle and hunted every deer in the woods. And when he got the last one, he looked at all the guys and said, restock it. <laughs> and he said, he wrote, a, he wrote a book to his the future king, his son. And you know what he, you know what he did? He wanted him to be a good king. And the first thing he said was, you have to have a good relationship with God. Not, you know, bust their chops and make them do what you tell them to do. Uh, and he said, there are sins. There, are, there were, I think, it was three sins that are unforgivable. Uh, and uh, I think one of them was witchcraft. And I willful murder and being effeminate. So he was not homosexual. If you heard that, just don't repeat the lie, okay? Uh, uh, was Erasmus a good Roman Catholic? <clears throat> and our King James Bible believer is a cult. Isn't that stupid? Are we a cult? Do you, do you guys have the tattoo? Do you have... <laughs> anyway, uh, and really that answer, that, now, now look, I'm going to tell you that. That book... Since 1989, and that, that is on the desk of the world's leading King James Bible haters. And since 1989, not one question or one answer in that book has been refuted. And you know they've looked it over. So, so that is out there. But they, that answers so many questions <clears throat> that they came up with new questions. So I came up with new books. Uh, this one, this one, that one goes one, one through 62. This starts at 63 and goes to number 90. Uh, where should a Bible believer begin in defending their Bible? Here's what your problem is. Uh, most of you, your problem is not that you don't know anything. You, you think you don't know enough, but you do. Your problem is some of you have never been to a Bible college or a seminary, and you're going to argue with a guy that's had five years of seminary, and you feel intimidated by his education, correct? Okay. If you ask the right question starting out, you totally disengage his education. You say, what's the question? Get the book. <laughs> uh, is the Bible settled in heaven? I love that one. That's, that's a coward's way of saying, I believe it's a perfect Bible, but it's in heaven. Could you ask me something? What are they doing with it? Going door to door? Really, let's send the NIV to heaven. They're not going to do anything with it anyway. We need the perfect Bible. Uh, can't another English version uh, be the perfect Bible? That is asked many times uh, in reference to the, the English translations that came out prior to the King James. There were several that came out before the King James, <clears throat> uh, and this uh, discusses that. Uh, is the King James Bible written in Old English? No, it is not. These and thou's are not Old English. You and I could not read Old English, okay? Uh, it's very much like, it would look like Gaelic. I was in Ireland. Uh, some years ago, and I went past all these signs, and they had all these letters on them, all in the wrong order, which was great. I could drive as fast as I wanted to, but um, uh, and it was Gaelic, and so you could not. We could not read Old English. Uh, Old English came in in uh, 450 AD, went to, six, uh, to 1066. Middle English started 1066, uh, went to 1450. You could, you could peruse Middle English and pick up a few words. There might even be a verse you could decipher, but you could not read an entire Bible in Middle English. Uh, so if modern English came into in existence in 1450, that means your King James Bible was 250 years after English came into being, modern English. So it is modern English. Now, what's the difference between <clears throat> fats and that's in different King James Bibles? That would be Joel chapter 2, verse 24, Joel chapter 3, verse 13. Some King James Bibles say, the fats, some say the vats, and some, some people make a big difference out of that. 
Uh, can you correct the originals with the King James Bible? Uh, and aren't conservative translations trustworthy? Some folks think if conservatives made it, it's okay, but if it's a liberal translation, it's bad. Uh, and I do a, uh, I do a, 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 a lesson. I, usually down in the States, we travel the pickup truck, and I got two briefcases full of modern translations. And what we'll do is we get eight guys up here, four here, four here, give them all a different translation. I think I was talking about the other day. And there are places we compare verses in, in nine translations, the Word of God and, and eight uh, inferior words. And there are places where the liberals got it more straight than the conservatives. So it's not liberal or conservative. It's modern translation. So uh, that is back there. So that goes from 63 to 90. And this is the third answer book. Uh, this goes from uh, 91 to 125. So through these three, cover 125 charges uh, brought against your King James Bible. How about this one? Can I preach from a King James Bible, <clears throat> but study from a modern version? I've actually had guys tell me that with a straight face. You know, I preach from the King James, but I study out of modern. <laughs> oh, so when you study, you study out of one that has mistakes in it. Right? And I'll tell you why they do that, because they don't believe the King James Bible. But they know if they preach out of a modern one, they'll get run out of their church. So they preach out of the King James to fool the congregation. Um, should the Bible be translated to adapt to different cultures? This one makes my skin crawl. Uh, I had a very good friend, uh, and somewhere along the line, he got away from the book. And here's what he said. I, I literally, I heard him in a tape. I heard him. He, he began a ministry of going around to King James Bible-believing churches and getting them off the King James. And um, I, I preach in New Guinea, and there are no sheep in New Guinea. There are no sheep. Uh, but there are pigs, and pigs are, are how you value, how you know somebody's rich. If you've got two pigs, five pigs, you are a rich person. And he claims that if you say, behold the Lamb of God in New Guinea, because there's no, no sheep, they won't understand it. I'm telling you the truth. He said it ought to be translated, John the Baptist looking at Jesus Christ, behold the pig of God. I know what God thinks about pork, guys. I'm telling you. Have you got some things you worry about answering at the judgment seat of Christ? Aren't you glad you don't have to answer for that one? Yeah, amen. Yep. They don't have snow in New Guinea. So what do you do with we're whiter than snow? So uh, that, one, that one, does the King James Bible promote slavery? No, it does not. What about the Spanish Bible? What about it? Um, so Daniel chapter 3, verse 25, that is where the three Hebrew children are in the, the fiery furnace. And Nebuchadnezzar looks at this and says, oh, I see four guys in there, and the form of the fourth is like the Son of God. Modern translations, including the new Schofield, uh, translate that, a son of the gods. Is there anybody here that got saved by believing on a son of the gods? I got saved by the Son of God. Uh, <clears throat> isn't the modern English version... Uh, an updated King James Bible. Uh, I got a I got a phone call probably about four years now. Uh, good man, good man, and uh, and he said, "What do you know about the modern English version?" And I said, "Well, until you told me, I didn't even know it existed." He said, "Well, it's not translated from the corrupt Alexandrian manuscripts, but it's it's translated from the TR, just like the King James." And he said, "There is a major uh, fundamental Bible college in the states." that is getting ready to take the step away from the King James and espouse the modern English because it comes from the TR. And he said, this is on Monday, and he says, Saturday, I'm supposed to meet with the faculty and tell them why they shouldn't do it. I don't have anything to tell them. So I said, well, give me a couple of days. And so I called him up. I did some crash research. I like research. I really enjoy it. And I did some crash research, and Wednesday I called him up, and we loaded his gun, uh, and they, they stayed with the King James. I, well, see, somebody said, I used to think it was a good thing. I wish I'd have told him nothing. I wish they would have left the King James and gone to the modern English. Say why? Then everybody would know they're not really King James. But anyway, and then this one, I want to get this one. Uh, I'm going to show it to you rather than tell you about it. Look at Psalm 46. And Psalm 46. Now, I will tell you that uh, King James and William Shakespeare were contemporaries and they were personal friends. And in Psalm 46, look at uh, verse 3. Though the waters thereof roar and be troubled, though the mountains shake with the swelling thereof, Salah. The word shake in that verse is the 46th word into the 46th Psalm. 
Now look at verse 9. He maketh wars to cease unto the end of the earth. He breaketh the bow and cutteth the spear, uh, uh, the spear asunder, in sunder. He burneth the chariot in the fire. The word spear in that verse is the 46 word from the end of the psalm. So 46 words in shake, 46 words from the end, Shakespeare. And here is the, here is the charge that is brought against your Bible. Because Shakespeare and King James were, were personal friends, and because Shakespeare died when he was 46 years old, King James ordered the translators to do what you just saw with the 46th Psalm in honor of his friend. If that is true, everything we say about the King James Bible is false. It's all, it's all a, a, a mirage and illusion. Say, uh, well, what's the answer? The answer is, get the book. That's what the answer is. Oh, you think I write this stuff? Anyway, so, uh, so those are back there. Uh, I told you my wife uh, will be there to take your money next month. Next month, we'll celebrate 52 years together. I can testify. That woman knows how to take money. <laughs> you have no idea what a blessing it is to me to see her taking someone else's money. So, uh, so those are back there, and she will help you. I'm sorry about the credit cards. Uh, if you want, just give us your credit card. In a few weeks, we get back to the States. <laughs> okay, anyway, uh, let, me, uh, <clears throat> let me get the message, and, and then we'll get started. <laughs> Point one. <laughs> you, you, you know, guys, I can preach this whole thing. Or we could take a really large offering right now and I can cut it short. <laughs> because I am a Baptist preacher and I cannot be bullied or intimidated. But I can be bought. Um, all right. I, uh, I'm going to have to ask you to uh, see something in your head. Uh, I ordinarily would have a board up here. I don't have a board to show you this. But it's also, uh, it won't be hard for you to uh, see it in your mind because it's probably something you've all seen. You know, we have, from, from beginning to end, our time that God deals with us is 7,000 years. And you have, from the beginning to the cross, is the Old Testament, and you had 4,000 years, correct? Say correct, okay? Do this. Just nod your head. I'll hear something. Uh, and then, at the cross, you have 2,000 years, which we know is the church age, and then there's going to be a 1,000-year millennium. So in this period of time, you got uh, before the cross, Old Testament, after the cross, New Testament. Is that not true? So that's what we think. We, we kind of consigned that 4,000-year period uh, as that's they had the Old Testament. We have the New. Is that right? Actually, it's not. I'll tell you why it's not right. The first book of your Bible was written in 1500 B.C. That means 1,500 years before the cross, there was... 1,600 years before the cross, there was no written word of God. 17, 18, 19. 2,500 years of the Old Testament, there was not one written word of God. you got 9,000 years. We say that's all Old Testament. Well, it, it, is, it is before the cross, but they did not have what we call the Old Testament. They didn't have anything. And so I know what, I, we know what they believed after the Bible was written, Correct. But what did they believe before Genesis was written? What did they believe in that 2,500-year period before Moses penned his first inspired word in the book that begins our Bible, the book of Genesis? Now, to know that, to know what they believed prior to Genesis, uh, we would have to have some chronicle, we would have to have some recording of, of what they believed, Right? We'd have to have something written before Genesis. And the fact is, uh, Genesis is the first book in your Bible, but it is not the oldest book in your Bible. There is a book in time that precedes Genesis, and that is the book of Job. So I want you to go to the book of Job. And the book of Job, uh, I, uh, I, I used an old Schofield Bible. Uh, I ignore his notes. That's pretty easy to do. But I like the, I, I got saved, and I got used to the page format, and I always know I'm looking for a verse that's in the right 
column on the second page, halfway down. You know, I, I, that makes it easier for me. But one of the things that I do like about this, uh, the, the Schofield, is it gives you dates that, that gives you approximate time of, of um, what's taking, what time everything you're reading about is taking place. And in Job chapter 1, this says 1520 B.C., 1520 years before Christ. That's when Job begins. Guys, who wrote the book of Genesis? Come on, guys. Moses. Do you know where Moses is in 1520? Moses in 1520 B.C. is 20 years into a 40-year stint on the backside of the desert. He has not come out of the desert. He's still got 20 years on the backside of the desert. Guys, I love, I, I look, I love the Lord. I, I love my God. But you know what I really love? Now, now if you're musical, you got to be impressed with God, the musician. He gives us only seven notes. And look at, we have not run out of combinations of the seven notes, right? I don't even like the way some people, you know, arrange those notes. But we haven't run out. Uh, and if you are artistic, I didn't say autistic. I worry about some of you. But... <laughs> If you are artistic, do you ever stop and think that everything you see is only three colors? Red, yellow, and blue. That's it. And everything you see is some combination of some combination of some combination of red, yellow, and blue. Yellow and blue, you get green. Uh, yellow and red, you get orange. Trump. Um, <laughs> and you take orange and put it with blue, and you have brown. And so... So every color we have out there, think about this. God gave us three colors, and we, he's totally equipped the whole world. I think that's just amazing about my God. Well, I am a writer, and I really appreciate God the writer. He's such a classy writer. Uh, Acts chapter 18. Uh, whoops, whoops. Acts chapter 18. Don't go there. You don't have to go there. Uh, you have Corne uh, No, 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 I'm sorry. Uh, you have Apollos, and he shows up teaching bad doctrine. And down about verse 26, he's teaching the baptism of John. I got news for you. If you got baptized by the baptism of John, you need to get saved. It might look. If you saw, if you saw John baptizing somebody, it was by immersion. Uh, if you saw Paul baptizing somebody after they trusted Christ, you could see them both and they would look similar. But you don't get baptized until you're saved. And, and it says about down, about, about down verse 26, it says, And Aquila Priscilla took him, and listen to this, expounded him the way of God more perfectly. Isn't that cool? They led him to Christ. His, his, his message changed instantly, going from the baptism of John to teaching that Jesus was Christ. So I like the writing. And I like the writing of God. You know, we, uh, yeah, I'm from Ohio. Uh, we're used to green. And now we live in a prairie. It's not really a desert. We don't have cactus. But it's like a desert without the cactus, Okay. Uh, hot, brown, uh, anything in our area uh, is only there because it's been uh, irrigated. And, you know, do you ever go to the desert? Like, go to Arizona sometime. People stop. Uh, I-15 sweeps across the south of Arizona. And there are, there are, it's been noted that people will get off, they'll pull off the highway, and they just want to walk around the desert. And they get out of sight of their car, they get so d disoriented and literally die from exposure. That is how deadly the desert is. You say, oh man, and Moses spent 40 years there? No, he didn't. He didn't spend 40 years in the desert. He spent 40 years on the backside of the desert. Is that not illustrative of our God? It's like, they're sending me to the moon. What could be worse? The dark side, right? I tell people, I said, if you spent 40 years on the backside of the desert, you would be talking to burning bushes too. <laughs> He's looking for God anyway. I bet that day he might have he might have talked to an iguana, maybe a tumbleweed. He saw a burning bush. May, may as well give it a chance. He changed his life. He's 20 years from that burning bush. He hasn't come out of the desert yet, and everything that we find in Job is going on. So this book in time precedes Genesis. So all we've got to do is, is uh, study this book, find out what they believe. Now, I, I got to give you a little bit of an introduction here. In fact, why don't I pray now, uh, and then because we're, we're going to look at a lot of scripture and we're going to jump around a little bit, uh, and you're probably going to miss Dancing with the Stars. Father, thank you now, God, for your goodness and your grace. Lord God, I think I speak for these people tonight <clears throat> when I say this. 
we have no problem with you because there is nothing wrong with you. And we have no problem with your book because there's nothing wrong with your book. And Lord God, I, I don't know what these people, uh, I don't know who they think the most uh, biggest problem their country has or the biggest problems they personally have, but God, the biggest problem I have is Sam Gibb. And so I pray now, God, uh, that you would get Sam Gipp out of these folks' way, out of your way, out of their way, speak to their hearts and accomplish your purpose in their lives. God, I pray that you will edify your people, that they being edified would leave here and live to your glory. And it is in Jesus Christ's name I pray. Amen. Now let me explain something about the book of Job, because Christians have two quiet, private fears about the book of Job. You are afraid, number one, that you're going to be so spiritual, that the devil is going to ask to do to you what he asked to do to Job. Let me relax you a little. You're probably not in danger of being that spiritual. All right? But the second one is, the devil never brought Job up. Um, if you do this, uh, and, and if you're Canadians, you do this, don't worry, because Americans, they're, they're so dumb, they do this all the time. And so... You may be as dumb as an American if you do this. People view the contest between our God, the God of the Bible, and Satan like it's a great big arm wrestling contest. And, and you know, something bad happened today. Oh, look, the devil's winning. Oh, look, something good happened today. Hillary shut her mouth. Uh, and, and, and so God's winning today. Guys, this is not it, okay? Our God is not like, oh, man, I hope I can beat the devil today. That is not the case. Let me tell you about our God. Uh, I, I think I was talking last night about uh, Evander Holyfield being the uh, heavyweight champ of the world. And um, they usually have uh, some kind of a uh, heavyweight bout. Uh, there's like three heavyweight champions of the world. I don't know how they do this. But they'll have a, a title bout. This challenger is going to take on the heavyweight championship, the champ. And so they interview the challenger, and they say, how do you think it's going to go? And he usually says something like this. I'll go knock him out of the three round. Because that is all the farther that he can count anyway. And, and what would you do if you're the challenger and you said, I'm going to knock the champ out in the third round. So they go to the champ. Hey, champ. said he's going to knock you out in the third round. How do you think it's going to go? And he said this. Well, well that's, that's my problem. I'm going to win. I can't lose. I'm going to beat the kid up. So to give him a chance of winning... For 40 days and 40 nights before the fight, I'm just not going to eat anything. Then when I get in the ring, I'll be real weak. You know, I have to laugh at Christians sometimes. You know, we get this pious idea. I have friends, preacher friends, that fast for 40 days and 40 nights. You have no idea how wonderful I think that is. That they fast for 40 days and 40 nights. Jesus did it once. That was enough. I'm not trying to, I'm not trying to compete with him. All right? And, uh, and, I, and you say, wow, if you fasted for 40 days and 40 nights, you'd really be spiritual. You'd really be hungry. I talked to one of those guys. You know what he said? He said, after 30 days, you can't even get out of bed. You lay in bed, and for the next 10 days, your body is digesting itself, trying to stay alive. Can you imagine being 40 days and 40 nights of eating nothing? He says afterward he was in hunger and getting in the ring with the greatest force of evil in the universe, Satan. That is what your God did and knocked the devil out through the ropes in three punches. It is written, it is written, it is written. That is your God. Your God, in, in Isaiah chapter 14, whipped the devil and kicked him out of heaven. Then there was a rematch in Matthew chapter 4 in the wilderness, 40 days and 40 nights, and he whipped him again. And now there is one more rematch coming up. It is, it is scheduled for the venue of a, of a valley in Megiddo in Israel. And if you say that you're saved, yeah, I don't know if you know this, but Satanists believe in the battle of Armageddon. They believe it all, it all ends up in the battle of Armageddon. They just think their guy's going to win. If you trust Christ as your personal savior, you know what you're doing? You are betting your soul on who's going to win that third, that third rematch. And so, <clears throat> this is your God. So, so it's, there's nothing to whip in the devil. I got to tell you this. Uh, I had a preacher friend, and he called me up, you know, and he's bummed. He's bummed out. He was praying for me, brother. I said, yeah, what's the matter? He was, I I've been trying to hear from God, 
And he said, I just finished a three-week fast, and I haven't heard a word from God. And I said, oh, man, thanks for telling me that. He said, why? I said, because now if I don't hear from God, I know that not eating for three weeks ain't going to make any difference. <laughs> Guys, I may not hear from God, but I'm going to not hear from God with a burger in my hands, all right? So when you have that kind of power, whipping the devil is nothing. So take a look at, uh, uh, you got Job 1, but go to Job chapter 41. Job chapter 41 unlocks why, why the book of Job happened. And it's not doctrinal. Uh, it's not devious. It's not some mortal combat. You'll be shocked. Look what it says, verse 1. Canst thou draw out Leviathan with an hook? Question, does that not sound like somebody's fishing? Can you get him with a hook? I can't get anything with a hook, okay? I was telling somebody the other day, when I go fishing, it is just worm murder. <laughs> I have apologized to the worms when I put them on the hook. It's not like a worm's rights thing. I don't care about the worm. I don't care that he's going to die. I care that he's going to die for nothing. All right? <laughs> Canst thou draw Leviathan with a hook, or his tongue with a cord which thou lettest down? Canst thou put a hook into his nose or bore his jaw through with the thorn? Will he make many supplications unto thee? Will he speak soft words unto thee? You have to get into a fight to understand verse 3. Verse 3, I don't know if you know this, but do you know what the, the object of a fight, I'm talking about a fist fight, and the object of a war are identical. You say, no, no, because in a war you're trying to kill people. You're not trying to kill people in a war. You do kill people in a war. I said, that's not the object. Yeah, you blow up buildings in a war. That's not the object. You know what the object of a fight is? To break the spirit of your enemy. That's why in the old days when I was a kid, two guys get in a fight, and a guy be on top, and the guy in the body go, let me up. He say, say uncle. I don't know why they said, say uncle. Say uncle. Uncle. <laughs> Do you know why we're having trouble with Muslims today? You know, in World War II, uh, the world went against two of the greatest world's armies known to men, the Japanese Imperial Army and the, and the German Army. And we did not just win that war. It wasn't about blowing up buildings or killing people, but finally... Both of those countries, Germany and Japan, said, we have had enough. We surrender. And today, our relationships with those two countries are two of the friendliest and greatest that we could have. Is that not true? How come the Muslims are so strong today? How come they are so bold? How come they are so energized? Because the idiot we had in the White House by the name of George Bush dropped bombs and bread out of the same planes. It, you know how, you're not going to win a fight if you punch a guy in the mouth and go, I have great respect for you. <laughs> and you hit him again and go, I owe you a lot. And he is dropping bombs and apologizing, and the will of the Muslims has never been broken, and that's why they're a problem today. George Bush was afraid of breaking their will. That's the only way you win. So he says he can put the devil down and say, say something nice to me. Call me Lord. Say he wouldn't do that. Yes, he did. You know what he said in Matthew chapter 4? When the, when the devil said, worship me, Jesus Christ pointed a finger at the devil and said, thou shalt worship the Lord thy God. He made him say it. He made him accept it. Verse 4, wilt thou make a, uh, will he make a covenant with thee? Wilt thou take him for a servant forever? Wilt thou play with him as with a bird? Or wilt thou bind him for thy maids? Play with him? Play with it? Does that sound like Mortal Kombat? Now, I'm going to say something, and ladies, you might want to do this because you're going to get upset. And if you get upset, I'm not going to care. Uh, I had a guy in my church, and he had a bird. Uh, it was, uh, I always never get it right, and it's a white bird. Cockatoo. He had a cockatoo. It was a Baptist bird. Because when we'd be over their house, as soon as we sat down to eat, this bird would start making a, a racket. And so this guy would open up the, the, the cage door. And when he opened up the cage door, you'd get this, this wooden dowel. And the bird's like this. And he'd open the door. He'd go like this. And this bird would go. <laughs> and he can't go any farther. I mean, John Calvin cut him off. And, and he'd get to the other side. And the guy go, shut up, bird. Bunk. And I'd say, oh, poor bird. Oh, come on, guys. It's a bird. Okay? And it didn't even have drumsticks big enough to, to eat. So it was, really wasn't even a bird that deserved to live. But um, 
But see, you can say, well, that was awful. But could the bird stop it? I had told this, somebody goes, what if he bit him? I said, he did. It was the funniest thing I ever saw. This bird bit his finger. It'd be like biting the top of a telephone pole. The bird goes like this. <laughs> That's what your God can do with the devil. It's not this, oh man, I hope I can win today. Your God could take one hair out of his head and beat the devil to death with it. And he can look at the devil, and I'd never advise you to do this, but he can look at the devil and say, I think I'll play with him. And here's what happens. I look at Job chapter 1. I want to show you what happened. Because I know what you say. I'm afraid that I'm going to be that spiritual. You're not going to be that spiritual. But the devil never brought Job up. Look at verse 6. Now there's a day when the sons of God came to present themselves before the Lord, and Satan came also among them. And the Lord said unto Satan, from whence comest thou? And Satan answered the Lord and said, from going to and fro on the earth and from running the Democratic Party. <laughs> well, I'm sorry, guys. Sometimes I do tend toward a modern translation. <laughs> Look at verse 8. And the Lord said unto Satan, hast thou considered my servant Job? Who brought up Job? Who brought, who, who, who brought the subject up? God did. I will tell you what I think. I think he was going. I think God this day was going to live, Job chapter forty-one. When the devil showed up, I think God just said today, "You know what I feel like doing today? I think I'll put a stick in the devil's eye." Watch, guys. He can't even resist. I'm going to throw the bait. I'm going to drop it right in front of him. You know, I told you I'm not a fisherman, but I like fishermen. I like guys that fish and catch things. When I go fishing, I catch a cold. And and you ever see a guy go? Oh man, watch. They're right over there. Watch. Plunk, wham, hits. And he told all of heaven, he said, guys, you know what I'm going to do today? I'm going to put a stick right in the devil's eye. Why? Sounds like fun. I'm going to play with him. And the stick had a name. Job. Hast thou considered my servant Job, that there is none like him in the earth, a perfect and upright man, one that feareth God and escheweth evil? I call that the bait. Verse 9, I call the bite. And watch him take it. Then Satan answered the Lord and said, Doth Job fear God for naught? Uh, I was talking to you guys last night. I think it was, yes, I think it was yesterday. Well, it had to be yesterday. Uh, you know, I think if you were there, I said in chapter 11 of Matthew, I wouldn't change a word of the Bible, but I'd like to put a little space between verse 15 and 16. And, and that was the silence when Israel rejected their Messiah. I would like to put a little space between verse 8 and 9. About a half an inch. And you know what I'd put in between there? Have you ever seen when a guy goes fishing and a, and a fish hits it and the reel goes zzzz? Now, I personally have never heard that sound, okay, when I go fishing. But I usually hear the whole rod and reel splashing into the water when I am overcome in grief. But, um, but if you catch somebody and that fish, that, that, that reel goes zzzz. Between verses 8 and 9, I would put a little space there. And however you make that sound, a bunch of zzz or what, because the devil took the bait. Bam! And hit him. Doth no, that Job fear God for naught? Look at verse 10. Hast not thou put a hedge about him, about his house, and about all that he hath uh, on every side? Thou hast blessed the work of his hands, and his substance is increased in the land. But put forth thine hand now, and touch all that he hath, and he'll curse thee to thy face. God thought Job was a Baptist. You mess with his toys, and he'll curse you. Could I give you a little sidebar? You know what some of you were thinking? You, you're afraid of the devil. Uh, and, and, and you don't have to be afraid of him because you have the, the word of God. But you know what you're afraid? He's trying to make me take drugs. He's trying to make me commit adultery. He's trying to make... No, he's not. No, he is not. No, he is not. Don't go there, but you might want to mark it down for later. Go to sometime. Go to Galatians chapter 5. Look at verses 19, 20, and 21. And it talks about the works of the flesh. And, and most of the things that we fear the devil's going to do, he's not even involved in. Guys, if the devil died today, the problems of, of, of Galatians chapter 5, verses 19, 20, 21, you would still have a problem because it's in our flesh. Look what the devil wanted to do. All he wanted to do was say something ugly about God. You know what some of you are doing? Some of you are saying, I'm determined not to give in to the devil. I'm not going to get drunk. I'm not going to take drugs. I'm not going to commit adultery. I'm not going to do this. I'm not going to murder anybody. 
No, that's fighting the flesh. And here's the problem. While you think you're fighting off the devil, but you're actually winning over the flesh, and then one thing happens, and you get mad at God, go behind a bar and shake your fist at him and say, you call yourself a God of love, and you do that? And you did exactly what the devil wanted. So he said, touch what he has, and he'll curse you to your face. Now, I want you to look at verse 13. And there was a day, and by the way, by the way, I want to, I want to clarify something. Um, look at verse 3. Look what he had. His substance also was 7,000 sheep and 3,000 camels and 5,000 yoke of oxen and 500 she-asses and a very great household. So this man was the greatest of all the men of the East. This man was not a great man. He was the pinnacle. Was he not? Was he not? Doesn't the Bible say the greatest? There was nobody more wealthy. There was nobody more great than this guy. This is the guy. This is the Elon Musk or whoever you want to count financially as the top of the Top of the, the, the uh, pinnacle. And look at verse 13. And there was a day when his sons and his daughters were eating and drinking wine in their eldest brother's house. And there came a messenger unto Job. And said, the oxen were plowing and the asses were feeding beside them. And the Sabaeans fell upon them and took them away. Yea, they have slain the servants with the edge of the sword. And I only escaped alone to tell thee. Now, you know, guys, I want to tell you, read the Bible, read the Bible, read the Bible. Uh, and I, I tell people this, and really you should do this. Try this, okay? Really try this. When you're reading your Bible, get out of your chair and get out of your room and get out of your house and get out of the time in which you're living and enter what you're reading. Enter the scene that you're reading. So here's what I want you to see. This is the greatest guy. This is the richest guy. So he's, he's sitting on his porch, sipping on iced tea, kind of looking over the spread. Uh, and he sees a guy running down the lane. Oh, I know that. He's one of my servants. Uh, he looks like he's in a hurry. He's, he's got some news for me. And he gets up there. He says, what's the matter? He said, he said, the oxen were feeding. He said, the asses were okay. And he said, the Sabaeans came, killed all the servants but me. I only am left. They took everything. Now, I got news for you. That is not... A tragedy. Oh, it's a tragedy for people who died, but really that for a rich guy, you think that was all of his wealth? You think it was all of his wealth? No. I still, he's, you know, that's kind of like one stock going down. But it's bad news. And then comes one of the most, one of the most chilling statements in the book of Job. It repeats itself over and over and over again. Look at verse 16. While he was yet speaking. While this guy is giving him the bad news, he sees another guy coming down the lane. It's happening. The second guy is showing up while the first guy's talking. Correct? I wonder what he's going to say. 16. While he was yet speaking, there came also another and said, The fire of God has fallen have burned up the sheep and the servants and consumed them and I only I only am escaped alone to tell thee. Now he just got some bad news. I mean he got bad news on top of bad news. Is that not true? But look how verse 17 begins. And while he was yet speaking. It hits it again. While he was yet speaking they came all, there came also another and said the Chaldeans made out three, three bands and fell upon the camels and have carried them away yea and slain the servants with the edge of the sword, and I only am, alone, uh, am, am escaped alone to tell thee. Look how the next verse begins. While he was yet speaking. He just heard about the oxen and the asses, heard about the camels, he heard about everything that he's got is gone. Correct? This is devastating. His, this man is now financially broke. But he sees another guy coming down the lane. What else do I have to lose? I've lost it all. What's this guy going to tell me? While he was yet speaking, verse 18, there came also another and said, Thy sons and thy daughters were eating and drinking wine in their eldest brother's house. And behold, there came a great wind from the wilderness and smote the four corners of the house, and it fell upon the young men, and they are dead. And I only am escaped alone to tell thee. Now we have a tragedy. The guy's got the house he's in. He's got his wife left. 
He has lost everything financially and he's lost every one of his children. That is devastating. That is a tragedy. That is a catastrophe. Is it not? And watch his reaction. And part of it makes sense. Look at verse 20. Then Job arose and rent his mantle and shaved his head and fell down upon the ground. That makes sense. He's, he's ripping his clothes off. Oh! And he, and, he, and he gets down on ground. But look how the verse 20 ends. And worshiped? Isn't that where you're supposed to say, why'd you do this to me? But he never did it. And, and worshiped. And said, verse 20, when naked came out of my mother's womb and naked shall I return thither, the Lord gave and the Lord hath taken away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Look, in all this, Job sinned not nor charged God foolishly. The first trial of Job is over. And he did not do what, God, what the devil said he'd do, correct? Now, here's what you can't see. Have you ever been watching a football game? A Canadian football is pretty good. You guys hit hard. It's nice to watch. I'm not talking about wearing shorts and playing kickball. I'm talking about football. And it's like, it's like three seconds left in the game. Your team is on the one-yard line, and they're losing. But this touchdown, they will win. And have you ever been watching, and, and, and when it's really a key play, you go like this. You lean into it. I can see the devil. When, when, the, when the fourth guy comes in and says, oh, man, even your kids are dead. And I can see the devil go, watch this, watch this. Watch. He's going to curse him now. And he's leaning in. And he said, naked come out of my mother's womb. Naked shall I turn again. Blessed be the name of the Lord. And you can't see it, but the devil is watching. And all of a sudden he goes, oh, ah, oh, oh, man, I got a stick right in the eye named Job. Guys, you think what happened to Job is a horrible thing. What God did with Job was the greatest compliment he's ever paid a man. You know what he knew? He knew I can let the devil do anything to him and he'll not curse me. Could he say that about you or me? This is not my message. Honest, this is not my message. But could he say that about you and I? So look at verse 2, or chapter 2. And again, there was a day when the sons of God came to present themselves before the Lord, and Satan came also among them to present, themselves, present himself before the Lord. And the Lord said to Satan, from whence comest thou? And Satan answered the Lord and said, from going to and fro in the earth and from walking up and down in it. And the Lord said to Satan, as thou considered my servant Job, that there is none like him in the earth, a perfect and an upright man, one that feareth God and escheweth evil. I don't know if you've noticed, but what I just read to you is chapter 1, verse 8. Word for word. The exact same bait. Now, if you were a fish, and you're swimming along, and you see this really juicy worm, and you go, man, that looks good. And just as soon as you grab it, all of a sudden, you get a piercing pain in the side of your mouth. You are going through the water faster than you ever swam. Next thing you know, you're flying through the air. Somebody grabs you, rips the hook out of you, and throws you back, all inside about 60 seconds. And the next day, you're swimming along, and you see a real juicy worm. I don't think a fish brain is very big. But don't you think you go, oh, man, that looks deja vu. I remember something like this. <laughs> and so here's you know what the Lord said. Now, here's what it is. Now, I want you to know something. Because there's something said about God that is not true. And if you believe it, you've been misled. Have you heard people say, God believes in balance? Do you hear that? God does not believe in balance. You can't show one verse in the Bible that says God believes in balance. You know, what, you know where they get that? They get it where God believes in moderation. And people say balance. He does not believe in balance. There's no place where it says he believes in balance. If you, if you think that, then you better make sure you've got as many men in this room as you have women so you have balance. And you better get as many homosexuals as you have straight people because you have to have balance, right? I can prove from this book, this book, Your Final Authority on All Matters, Faith, and Practice, is it? I can prove from this book that God does not believe in balance. When they built the temple from that wall to this wall, back here was the Holy of Holies, and they had to put a curtain up so that, so that the eyes of man could not see into the Holy of Holies. And if you took five panels of curtains and connected them, that would bring you dead center here, and five panels from that wall would bring you dead center. Have you ever gone to a school like a school play, you're sitting in a gymnasium, somebody's up on a stage, and they got the curtains together, dead center. You ever see that? 
But did you ever do this? Did you ever notice that they, they meet here? But as you follow them down, maybe right at the bottom, they part. And you can see a little bit behind the curtain. Right? God did not say, bring five from this side and bring five from this side. You know what he said? Bring five from this side and six from this side. So that the six over, if you walked and looked at the curtains in the, in the, in, at the temple, they wouldn't be dead center. It'd be off center. You say, why? In the, remember what I'm about to tell you. God will sacrifice balance for holiness. He didn't want anybody to see the Holy of Holies. So he wasn't worried about him meeting dead center. He wanted to make sure that nobody saw the Holy of Holies. So God does not believe in balance. But this day he believed in balance. Because he looked at the devil and said, Hey, Mike, Gabe, look at that patch on his eye. Isn't that cool? But you know, I believe in balance. And he's only got one black eye. And I'd like to balance the old boy out. And he says, watch this. Same bait. Boop. Hast thou considered my servant Job? There's none like him in the earth. Uh, the, a perfect and upright man. One that feareth God and skewed evil. And watch this. He had a little something to it. And still he holdeth fast his integrity, although thou movest me against him to destroy him without cause. Now, guys, again, between verse 3 and 4, we got that little space. And I can hear it. Every time I read verse 3, I hear, because he hits that bait again. And look at verse 4. This is the greatest source of evil in the universe. And look how he talks. And Satan answered, the Lord said, skin for skin. <laughs> skin for skin. All the man half will give for his life. I mean, is this who you're afraid of? <laughs> he took the bait again. Don't you think when the devil heard this, Hast thou considered my servant Job that there's none like him in the earth, a perfect, upright man with the earth, kind of skewed with evil? Don't you think the devil about that time said, Ah, oh man, deja vu. That makes my eye hurt. <laughs> but he has to hit the bait. And he hits the bait. Skin for skin, yea, all that a man hath will he give for his life, but put forth thine hand now and touch his bone and his flesh, and he will curse thee to thy face. Same challenge. Didn't want him committed. To Why didn't he say this? You touch his health, and he'll commit adultery. You take everything he owns, and he'll go get drunk. He said, he'll curse you. That's what he wants us to do. He wants us to say something ugly about this God that we tell everybody that we love. Uh, look at verse uh, 6. And the Lord said unto Satan, Behold, he is in thine hand, <clears throat> but save his life. So went Satan forth from the presence of the Lord, and smote Job with four sore boils from the sole of his foot unto his crown, and he took, a, uh, took him a potsherd to scrape himself with all, and he sat down amongst the ashes. I don't know if you've ever had a boil. I think everybody should have at least one. Uh, it's kind of like it ought to be standard operating equipment. Everybody, have you had your boil yet? Um, I had a boil on the side of my hip, on the side of my leg when I was nine years old. Still got a little button scar there. Man, it was the most painful thing I ever went through. I can't imagine boils not from the not from the top of my feet but from the soles i can't even stand up boils everywhere no matter where you lay you're laying on a boil no wonder he sat in ashes it was that was their their equivalent to memory foam he had to have something that give a little bit and i'm going to tell you something guys don't pat yourself on the back about a victory you haven't fought yet i cannot tell you that if god put me through what he put job through that I would not curse God. I have gotten mad at him over far less. And I have said some things to my great God that I have had to go back behind the barn and apologize for. And I never had went through what Job went through. Then said, verse 9, then said, <clears throat> said his wife unto him, Dost thou still retain thine integrity? Curse God and die. Let me say something about this lady. Uh, I, I hear preachers say this all the time. I really, it really gets me upset. Uh, I've heard preachers preach about Job's wife, you know, curse God and die. What a wicked woman. How evil. Can I ask you a question? Didn't she lose everything she owned too? Didn't she? Did she lose her 10 children? Ladies, wasn't she a little closer to them coming into this world than Job was? All he was doing was walking the hospital floor. What was she going through 10 times? 
And though we make a big deal about the man being the head of the woman, which means Job is her head, and what is he doing? He's got boils from the top of his head to the bottom of his feet, and he thinks he's going to die. Job chapter uh, 17, verse 1, you know what he says? The graves are ready for me. I am going to die. You think she's having a bad day? I get so, I get so mad when guys, what an ungodly woman. I think she's normal. And I think Job took care of it. He said this. But he said unto her, Thou speakest as one of the foolish women speaketh. What? Shall we receive good at the hand of God? And shall we not uh, shall we not receive evil? Hey, lay off. Her head, Job, took care of it, didn't he? So what are you worried about? But then look at the rest of that. In all, in all this did not Job sin with his lips. You know why that's the last? That is it. This is the last trial of Job. There's only two. Take what he's got, he'll curse you. He didn't. Touch his flesh, he'll curse you. He didn't. Do you know why the, the, the trials of Job ended right here? Because the devil only has two eyes. <laughs> and he's looking there, and, you know, he's got one eye. Whack! Oh, man, he's got, he got a stick in both eyes. And with, with chapter 2, verse 10, the trials of Job are over. The devil makes, never makes another appearance in the book. This is a, how come there's 40 more chapters? Because Job's three friends, Larry, Curly and Mo. They show up. You know what's wrong with most of you? You're like most Christians. When you think of the book of Job, you're afraid of being Job. And I'm afraid that we usually show up as one of the three friends. As soon as something happens to somebody we're upset with, we, you know they did disagree with me. They had that flat tire, but that's right after I told them that I was right and they were wrong. I even had a verse. Jesus wept. <laughs> So if you if you were those people who go, me and the Bible sent a big book, get mad at those three guys. There would it would be 40 less chapters if they'd have stayed home. That's the truth. So I said all that for this reason. His three friends were in error in the charges they brought against him, correct? But they knew some Bible, or they knew some stuff, not some Bible. And what I'm saying is this: you guys might work a job and there's a guy. He's a Pentecostal. Uh, he believes in the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. That's how you get saved. But he thinks you can lose it. Or he thinks you got to jump around speaking in tongues. And he's wrong about that. But he's right about the doctrine. Uh, you may have some friends. They don't agree with you about the King James Bible. But they do believe in, in creation, not evolution. Do you understand? In other words, somebody could, could be not 100% right, but they could be a little right. And we're going to get the testimony of what they believed before Genesis was written, not just from Job, but from these three. So we're going to get four different testimonies of what they believed before Genesis was written. And by the way, that is not what this message is about. Uh, they're going to tell us what they believed before Genesis. I am going to tell you what they believed before Genesis. But this message is about the one thing they could not believe. Absolutely astounding. We're going to look at what they believed. And then we're going to look at what they could not believe. Let's look at the first thing they believed. Look at Job chapter 4. And in Job chapter 4, this is El Eliaphaz. Eliaphaz is the Hebrew word for Larry. <laughs> Verse 17. Shall mortal man be more just than God? You say, what's the big deal about that? That's an amazing statement. You know what you guys overlook? Because we have been raised in a world where even... Even, the, even bad religions, mistaken religions who teach the wrong thing, believe there's one God. But paganism believes in multiple gods. They're polytheistic. Uh, there's the river God. There's the desert God. There's the rain God and the snow God and the wind God. And uh, the Romans, the Romans had something like 250 gods. The Roman Catholic Church, they have something like 700 gods. They call them saints. I don't know how many we have. We only have one. Well, I don't know. What's that angel you got home? You go to the Christian bookstore, and here's the angel of faith, and here's the angel of depression, and here's it. We just call them angels, Catholics call them saints, and the other heathen call them gods. I don't need an angel. I got the Son of God. Why would I go lower than that? So get your statue if you want, but be careful of it. But they believed in one God. 
Where'd they get that from? I'll guarantee everybody, you know what the Romans would do? They would talk about their gods like us guys talk about cars. I'm a Chevy guy. Only for one reason, they're the best. Thank you, thank you. But a Ford guy goes, oh man, we're an idiot, Chevy. You know, Chevrolet, if you don't shove her, she lays. Oh yeah, Ford, found on road dead. Oh no, it's Mopar, it's Mopar or no car. You listen to three guys that are Chevy Dodge and uh, Chevy Chrysler and Ford, and they are at each other like, why do you get rid of that, that Ford and get a real car? That's how, the, that's how the pagans talk about their gods. You'd have some guy in Rome, and he's, he's, he's sacrificing the seven or eight gods, and everything's going bad. And this guy says, I told you those gods are no good. You need, since I've been worshiping my gods, I've been making offerings to these gods. Everything's been going great. Dump your gods, get mine. That's how they talk. At the time of Job, they said there's only one God. That is totally out of character. But look at the rest of the verse. Shall mortal man be more just than God? Shall a man be more pure than his maker? Did this guy who was so wrong about Job have it right about creation? Didn't he just say that man has a maker? Let me ask you something. Do you believe you have a maker? Don't we believe we have a maker? Okay, if I ask you, do you believe you have a maker? What are you going to say? Yeah. Where'd you get it? Well, you take me to Genesis chapter 1. They didn't have Genesis chapter 1. Take a look. Take a look at uh, Job chapter 22. Job chapter 22. The guy doing the talking right here. Uh, this is uh, Eliaphaz again. And look at verse, oh, 14. That's not what I want. Oh, I, okay. I'm sorry. I'm looking at another point. Uh, go to Job chapter 20. Now I feel better. Job chapter 20. And this is Zophar. And Zophar is the Hebrew word for curly. And look what he says in verse 4. Knowest thou not this of old, since man was placed upon the earth? All right, can I ask you a question? Do you believe there's one God? Do you believe he is the maker and that he placed man on the earth? Yes. And we are the guys because we are, with a Bible believer, the, the, the Bible is not a prop that we carry so people know we're Christians. With us, it's all about the book. Isn't that true? And when somebody says, why do you believe that? Give me a book, chapter, and verse. And you better have a book, chapter, and verse on everything we believe. Isn't that who we are? How'd they get a book, chapter, and verse? They had no book, no chapter, no verse. Look at uh, verse uh, chapter 33. Chapter 33. Look at verse 6. Now this is Elihu. This is the fifth guy. I told you there was, there was Job, Larry, Curly, and Moe. And then there was Eli Elihu. And he's writing all this stuff down. Look what he says in verse 6. Behold, I am according to thy wish in God's stead. I also am formed out of the clay. Now, hearing that man is formed out of the clay, I'll bet you nobody here just got surprised, right? You already believe that before you walk through the door, correct? And if I say, well, why do you believe that? You're going to go back to Genesis and show God digging up the clay and put him up there and go, Adam. But they didn't have Genesis. They didn't have chapter one or two or three. Look at chapter 34. Job chapter 34. Look at verse 15. All flesh shall perish together, and man shall turn again unto dust. So we have a funeral, we say, from dust thou art, to dust shalt thou return. And you know exactly why we say it, don't you? We have a book, chapter, and verse for the dust and the clay and the maker and being placed on the earth and there being one God. They didn't have a book. They didn't have a chapter. They didn't have a verse. And they, be they believed what you believe. Is that not true? So what did they believe? Well, they believed there was one God. They believed that man was a created being. He had a maker. He was made out of clay. He was placed on the earth. When he dies, he turns to dust. I don't think there's anybody here going to argue against what I just said. Correct? Now go back there. I told you to look at uh, chapter 22, and I'll show you something else they believed in. 14 and 15. Thick clouds are a covering to him uh, that he seeth not, and he walketh in the circuit of heaven. 
Hast thou marked the old way which wicked men have trodden? Look at verse 16. Which were cut down out of time, whose foundation was overflown with a flood. If I tell you there was a worldwide flood, if I say that tonight, is there anybody here that's going to go, I never heard of that before? Is there anybody here that's going to say, I never heard of Noah, never heard of the ark, never heard of 40 days of rain, and everybody was killed on the earth but eight people? Is there anybody here that doesn't have that down? So, but see, if, you, if I say, why do you believe it? You're going to take me to Genesis chapter 7 and show me what it says, correct? They couldn't take you to Genesis 7. Moses is still 20 years more in the desert, in the backside of the desert, and they are, they are preempting him. It's like Job, it's like Moses might have had a copy of Job going, oh, yeah, this, oh, this is good stuff. But the fact is that they believe in a flood. You believe in a flood. Is that, well, like Banff. Banff is beautiful. We, we love Banff. It is really a beautiful place. And, and uh, they used to. Now it's past. It's past. They don't have them. They used to have two kinds of park rangers. They'd have a guy, maybe 50, 55, just getting a little bit gray right here. Looks like a state trooper. And he's just there to keep you from eating the pine cones and getting eaten by a bear. And then you got the granolas. Seedy-looking, pimple-faced, matted hair, and they're there to protect the grass from you. We were, we, were, we were someplace, one of those places, and it said, be careful that you don't step on the cryptobiotic crust. Cryptobiotic. Is this a... Superman movie. <laughs> Fortunately, they put a picture of it. So we knew. Ooh, that was the wrong thing to do. <laughs> I have three sons. My wife and I have one difference. I had three boys. She had four. <laughs> so uh, our my oldest son, John, was about 11 or 12. So what I had him do... I, I said, I told him what to do. And I started taking a, a video of the cryptobiotic crust. And I started to do kind of like a National Geographic special. And ladies and gentlemen, we are now looking at the cryptobiotic crust. It's been here for millions of years. And we need to preserve. And about the time I'd say something like, you, you'd hear this. <sighs> And he used Kleenex drops right there. And then his big size 11 goes right on top of it and leaves a big imprint. It's still there to this day. It has been petrified. It is there for all mankind. They think that Neanderthal wore tennis shoes. You say, well, that's really wicked. For stepping on dirt? Guys, when you are afraid to step on dirt... They ought to be feeding you under the door, okay? And not let you eat anything sharp, use anything sharp when you eat. So they believed in the flood. So we're in this one of these national parks. And some guy is asking this, this young granola girl about the formations, the, the rock formations. She said, well, that was done by water. And I went, oh, you mean like a flood? And here's what she, not that. Isn't that funny? She knew, oh, she knew. Guys, I fly over my country all the time. And if you fly over the United States, again, I don't know about your country, but I fly mine over mine constantly. I'll, I'll fly over it four or five, six times a month during the school year. And I am not a hydrologist, but I can tell you that you can see where some of these ranges were formed by water radically, rapidly flowing and just burrowing, uh, cutting the burrows in. There was a flood. They believed in a flood. You believe in a flood. I know why you believe in a flood. You read Genesis. They never read Genesis. So they believed there was one God. They believed he was our maker. We were made out of clay. He placed us on the earth. He turned back into dust, and there was a flood. What else did they believe? Now, before I show you this next one, go to chapter 8. You may be here tonight, and you may not agree with me on what I'm going to show you. And if you don't, you're not stupid. I, I do not think that being... Uh, disagreeing with me is stupid or, or anything else. I don't call people names like that. Um, but I'm not a heretic for believing something different than you. And here's what it says. Look at chapter 8 and look at verse 8. This is Bildad. You know who Bildad is? Yeah. The Hebrew word for mo. For require, I pray thee, of the former age. Former age. 
Does this not sound like there was something around before us? Does that sound like something was going on? Look at chapter 4, verse 18. Behold, he put no trust in his servants, and his angels he charged with folly. You know all about the angels that kept not their first estate, right? But that's because you've got a book, chapter, verse 4. They didn't. And he just told us there was a former age. Now, I believe there was a former age. I want to make something clear in what I'm about to say. I do not believe in the gap theory. The reason I say I don't believe in the gap theory is for this reason. There is a, there is a statement that between Genesis 1, 1, and 1, 2, there was a gap, and that is the gap theory. Now, I'll tell you why I don't, I don't sign on to that. that. That name, gap theory, was started in the 50s by a bunch of, of uh, modernists. And they wanted to explain, they, they wanted to believe in evolution, but they wanted to believe in creation. So they said there was a gap. Now, you got 7,000 years in this book, and there was a gap between Gen Genesis 1, 1, 1, 2 of 4.2 billion years. And everything that took place in evolution happened between, between Genesis 1, 1, 2. Be careful when you say the gap theory. I don't believe in the gap theory. Do I believe something went on between Genesis 1, 1, 1, 2? Absolutely. Yes, I do. I think there was a former age. You say, well, what do you know about it? Not a lot. Why not? Because none of my business. Um, if you ever go down to the States, go down to Kentucky. And if you go down to Kentucky, people live in a holler. And I have driven in Kentucky, and you're, I mean, it's, it's like this. And you got this little car here. If you want to see the sky, if you look to the left or right, all you see is the hill. It's green. You have to look up like this. You could, you could be here. And you want to go three miles away, and it takes you 20 miles because you've got to go 10 miles up the holler and 10 miles down. So there's, there, that, that is what they have. Um, why did I tell you that? There's a reason. It's really good. Really good. If I think of this. But, um, oh, people say, well, what about the former age? You're driving between, in, between these hills, and you know what's your business? The road in front of you between the hills. You say, well, what's on the other side of the mountain? Another idiot just like you saying, what's on the other side of the mountain? <laughs> Can you see the other side of the mountain? No, you cannot. But you might see a little. You might look at the top of that and see the top of a tree that is rooted on the other side of the hill, correct? You might see smoke coming up and saying there must be a house over there. We see a little before and a little after, but we don't see what's going on there. Because our business is the holler. Our business is here. And that's what you should worry about. But we see a little. I think there were, I think there were angels that run the show. I think that Satan was had it. Uh, I think Satan fell. Um, but I think it was only, well, I don't think it was a million years. I don't think it was four million years. I don't think it was four billion years. But it had to have some time, didn't it? I don't know if you know this, but they have found skeletons of giants. I'm talking about guys that would go from here to the piano. Skeletons. Well, there were giants. The Bible tells us, Genesis 6, there were giants. Uh, they have found homes or houses or the remainder of, of um, communities. They can't figure out, figure out anything about it. 1990, I was in the, the Southwest, Pacific, South, uh, South Pacific, in Micronesia, in a little island by the name of Koshrai, Micronesia. And they're islanders, and they're great people. And they said, we want to show you Lemma. Yeah, okay, let's see it on. You know what Lella is? Have you ever seen where there used to be a house standing and all you can see is the bricks of the foundation in the ground? That's Lella. We went to Lella on the island of Koshrai, Micronesia, and there is the remainder of huge buildings Blocks the size of this. Black. Totally black. None of the stones, the rock of that stone is found on that island. And you know who built it? They don't know. The people that live on that island have no idea how Lella got on their island. Somebody was there. I don't know if you know this, but uh, about 20 miles off the coast of Florida in the Caribbean, there is a wall. You say, it can't be, there's water. Yeah, there's a wall. It's 70 feet underwater. It's got huge stones. It is gun barrel straight and goes for a mile. 
Well, that must have been above the ground at some point or somebody held their breath a long time. So there are there is evidence that someone was here before us. Now, if you don't believe that, that's fine. But I think there was. But this brings us to a question. How much time do they have? If I don't think there was four billion years, if I don't think there was one million years, how many how much time between Genesis 1, 1, 1, 2? How much time do we have? I don't mean tonight. How much time do we have? Don't we have 7,000 years? <laughs> I hope we have tonight. I'm going to take about 1,000 to finish this message. We get 7,000 years. I think they had 7,000 years. I don't believe the earth is 6,000 years old. I think it's 13,000 years old. Now, you don't have to agree with that. But you know what I noticed? Now, I'm not, I don't sign on to the science and, and all that stuff. But this uh, radiocarbon dating... They will date things to 10,000 years and 13,000 years, and they'll even go 14. I'll give them a 1,000-year hedge. But after they get about 14, the next jump is 150 million years. And they, boom. Uh, they had this, uh, there, was a, there was a shark. I think it's called Megalodon. Uh, it has, it has, they call it, they call it um, Megamouth. When it opened its mouth from the top to the bottom was 11 feet. Megalodon in Latin is Hilarius Clintonius. <laughs> and I'm watching a, a special on Megamouth. Her husband became, oh, never mind. Um, <laughs> and here's what the guy said. Now, these are all lost guys. And this guy says, they got the jawbone so they can do radiocarbon dating. And they said, and this guy, what he said, he told about the result of the radiocarbon dating, but never broke stride, never stopped, just kept talking. And he said, we have radiocarbon dated this to 11,000 years old, but we know this lived 150 million years ago. So science tells them only 11,000 years, but they believe uh, 150 million because they can't handle the truth. So I think something went on. You don't have to believe that. But they said there was a former age. I'm just going to give you a thought, because you probably haven't had a thought. If they had a 7,000 years, and we are going to have 7,000 years, how many is that? Come on, you public school guys. Seven and seven. Four, no, not 14. Can't you guys get it right? It's the Yeah, 14. 14. Anyway, um, doesn't God do things... In threes. Doesn't he? All right, I'm going to ask you a question. You're all scared to death. You're all scared. Is there, what is the difference between generation, being generated, and creation? Was, uh, were Cain and Abel created or generated? Come on. Generated. Generation takes a man and a woman. And they generate. I'm not going to go into details, but they generate. I was generated. You. That's why we say our generation. Correct? Tell me somebody who was created. Adam. Did he have a father and mother? No. He was not generated. He was created. Creation is a special act and completely distinct from generation. Right? Okay, so... I'm going to give you a verse, and when you go home tonight, if you don't like what I said, you can scratch this out of your Bible. But look at Psalm 100. I never get it right. Try 102. Psalm 102. And Psalm 102. Yeah. Look at verse 18. This shall be written for the generation to come. Oh, man and woman generated somebody, correct? Correct. Keep reading the verse. And for the people which shall be created shall praise the Lord. Did your final authority just tell you that sometime in the future somebody's going to be created? Come on. Did it say that? You can't deny it. You can't scratch it out. So what do you believe? I believe that our time doesn't start with Genesis 1-1. It started with Genesis 1-2. I don't believe that our, our time ends at Revelation chapter 22, verse 19. Our time ends at chapter 20, verse 15. The end of the millennium is chapter 20, verse 15, and you have the white throne judgment. Then you have two whole chapters. 
that go beyond our 7,000 years. Say, what do you think is going on? I don't know. Other side of the hill. It's the other side of the ridge. I got, I got the giants on that side of the ridge, and I got somebody being cratered on that side of the ridge. I'm trying to keep this between the ditches, between the hills. So you can think what you want about those sites, and you can disagree or agree. You can make a big deal about it. Don't make a big deal about it, guys, because you need to make sure you're driving down straight down the road, okay? But they believed in the former age. Uh, take a look at Revelation. Oh, wait, wait. No, no. Go to, go to, go to, go this. I gotta, I gotta do this. Get uh, Genesis 1 1 and get Jeremiah chapter 4. Now, I, I gotta ask you this. Have you ever heard somebody take two verses that did not belong together and try to merge them to, to teach something? It's like putting a square peg in a round hole and they're going to drive it through because they're trying to prove a point. You ever somebody, you know, they're trying to jam something in because they're trying to teach something. Is that wrong? Isn't it? Yeah. Isn't it just as wrong if you had two verses that are like this and you try to pull them apart and say they're not connected? Look at Genesis 1, 1 and 1, 2. In the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. Look at verse 2. And the earth was without form and void. Is that not very descriptive? Look what else it says. And darkness was upon the face of the deep, and the Spirit of God moved upon the face of the waters. Guys, the earth was without form and void, and darkness was upon the face of the deep. Is that not very descriptive? The earth was without form and void, but that, that is not the only time that appears in the Bible. Look at Genesis, Jer Jeremiah chapter 4. Look at verse 23. I beheld the earth, and lo, it was without form and void. I dare, I dare anybody to tell me that this isn't connected to Genesis 1-2. It's the same thing. Look, I beheld the earth, and lo, it was without form and void, and the heavens, and they had no light. You know, kind of like darkness on the face of the deep. That's Genesis 1-2. I'm sorry, I don't think you're honest if you try to tell me that Genesis 1-2 and Jeremiah chapter 4, verse 23 are not together. It's the only time earth without form and void appears, two times, and they're connected. I beheld the mountains, and lo, they trembled, and all the hills uh, moved lightly. I beheld, and lo, there was no man, and all the birds of heaven were fled. I beheld, and lo, the fruitful place was a wilderness, and all the cities thereof were broken down at the presence of the Lord. And by his fierce anger. Does this not sound like God got really mad at somebody on the other side of the ridge? But he wasn't done, was he? Look at the next verse. For the Lord hath said, the whole land shall be desolate, yet will I not make a full end. I guess not. Here we are. So if you don't want to believe in that, that's fine. But you want to believe in this one? Look at Job chapter 11. Job chapter 11. And in Job chapter 11, I'm sure you believe this. Look at verse 8. It is as high as heaven. What canst thou do deeper than hell? What canst, canst thou know? Is there anybody here that before you ever came here, you didn't believe that heaven was above us and hell was below us? Didn't you believe that before you walked in the building? And if I ask you why you believe it, you're going to take me somewhere. You're going to take me to Luke chapter 16 about hell believing, being below us. I mean, you've got a book, chapter, and verse on heaven and hell. Is that not true? And they believed in heaven, high as heaven, hell beneath our feet. Look at um, chapter 33, Job 33. Now, I do not contend that every single time the word pit appears in the Bible. But there are many times when the bird, uh, that it appears in the Bible that it always talks about hell. But there are many times when it does. Numbers chapter 16, the earth opened up, Korah, Dathan, and Byron. They and their, their, their children, 250, went live into the pit. The earth opened up and they went into the pit. Look at chapter 33, look at verse 18. He keepeth back his soul from the pit and his life from perishing by the sword. Look at verse 24. Then he is gracious unto him and saith, Deliver him, deliver him from going down to the pit. They believed in heaven. They believed in hell. They didn't believe anything. There was no purgatory. They believed in heaven. They believed in hell. In fact, look at that verse 24. Deliver him from going down to the pit. I have found a ransom. Anybody here need a ransom? 
I needed a ransom. You know why I'm here tonight? I found a ransom. His name was Jesus Christ. Look at verse 28. He will deliver his soul from going down into the pit. And his life shall see the light. You know, that's one of the most remarkable verses. You know why? Uh, when I got saved, um, some of my buddies called me. And they say, uh, I heard you got religion. Nope, had religion. I was a Catholic. I had religion. And um, some of them said, hey, Gip, I heard you've seen the light. You hear me talk about the getting saved and seeing the light? I always thought when people said he saw the light, I thought of Acts chapter 9, Saul on the road to Damascus, he sees the light, and he ends up saved. Correct? But that just said they saw the light. Isn't that amazing? In his life, you'll see the light. Look at verse 30. To bring back his soul from the pit. So what did they believe? They believed in it. Now look, here's what they believed. They believed in one God. They believed in that he was our maker. He made us out of clay. He placed us on the earth. When we die, we go back to dust. They believed in a flood. They believed in a former age. They believed in a place called heaven. It was above us. They believed in a hell, a place called hell. It was beneath us. Have they gotten off? Would, you, would we let these people in our church? They got this stuff pretty straight so far, don't they? I'll look at uh, verse six, uh, chapter, chapter 16. And I hate to say this, but I've got to say it. I'm not making a horrible charge against your church. Your pastor is a personal friend. I love him. But I think you, your church has changed this doctrine. I do. Look what it says. Chapter 16. Look at verse 19. Also now behold, my witness is in heaven and my record is on high. Okay, I have a question. Does anybody here believe that everything you ever did is recorded in heaven? Can you give me a book, chapter, and verse on it? Besides dope. <laughs> See what I'm saying? Some of what we believe, we'd go to the verses I'm giving you. They didn't have anything. Now here's where I say you change doctrine. We used to think, we always think that somewhere up in heaven is a great big library with big thick books with everything you ever did in your life. And then they came along with reel-to-reel -reel tapes and 16 millimeter films. And we thought they got rid of all the books and they had a library full of 16 millimeter films and reel-to-reel -reel tapes. And then cassettes and VCRs came along and you changed your doctrine. You believe that no more real, real tapes and no more books. It was VCRs and cassette tapes, a whole library up in heaven, everything you ever did. And then CDs and DVDs came along and we changed our doctrine again. And we believe that there were a bunch of great big DVD player in heaven. When we get up there, God's going to put your life in there and play your DVD. And then you changed your doctrine again and you finally got it right because now you believe it's in the cloud. <laughs> but you do believe that everything is written down everything you've done is recorded and there will be a judgment isn't that what you believe that's what they believe and they didn't have one book that you had they didn't have one chapter that you had they didn't have one verse that you have and yet they still believed it what else did they believe look at chapter 19 it gets very interesting and I'm just about done. Just uh, 64 more points and I'm finished. Look at chapter 19 and look at verse 25. For I know that my Redeemer liveth. Whoa. Am I talking to anybody that needed a Redeemer? You need a Redeemer, don't you? Now I look, I'm going to tell you something. Uh, I think words do have different meanings. Uh, I don't think salvation is redemption. I think it all takes place. But here's, to me, to me, now you can do what you want. You know what redemption means to me? Do you ever buy a, a can of Coke? Nobody buys a Coke can. They buy a can of Coke, right? Coca-Cola. Then you drink it and you pitch the can. Why? Because you wanted what was in it. Nobody buys the can. They buy, they want the Coke that's in it. So when you're done and some guy comes along and says, I can redeem this for 10 cents. Do you ever see any guy, they take Coke cans, unfortunately sometimes beer cans, and make little biplanes out of them and put them in the yard? Or, or little windmills? 
all made out of used aluminum cans. You saw this as scrap and he saw value in it and he said, they threw it away, but I can use it. You know what the devil will do? He will use you and use you and use you. And when he's done, like an empty can, when he's got everything out of you that he can get, he'll toss you alongside the road and go on down the road. And then somebody with a nail hole in his hand reached down and picked you and me up and said, I think I do some of this. And look what he has done. Isn't it amazing what God has done with something that the devil was done with? So I have a redeemer. You have a redeemer? Isn't it nice to have a value to God after you're saved? He had a redeemer. Wait, not only did he have a redeemer, look at the whole verse. For I know that my redeemer liveth, and that he shall stand at the latter day upon the earth. Okay, is Jesus Christ, where is he right now? Is he on the earth or is he in heaven? I'm talking about physically. Is he in heaven or on the earth? He's in heaven. But we all believe what? He's coming down one of these days. He's going he's to live on this earth. He's going to sit in a throne in Jerusalem in the temple, and he's going to rule this earth from here. That's what it talks about in New Heaven, New Earth in Revelation chapter 21. So guys, you all believe that one of these days your Redeemer will stand on this earth. Is that not true? That's what they believe. Without a book, without a chapter, without a verse. What else did they believe? Look at verse 19, or chapter 19 and verse 26. Tell me if you believe this. And though after my skin worms destroy this body, yet in my flesh shall I see God. Some of you have, oh, probably maybe not your folks. Maybe they're not dead long enough. I don't mean any kind of unkind or joke. But you got maybe a grandparent, a great-grandparent that was saved. Maybe a great-great-grandparent that was saved and they died. And by now they're probably dust. Isn't that true? And yet don't we believe that they're going to stand in front of God in their flesh? So look at all they believed that you believe. You believe it with a book and a chapter and a verse. They just believed it. I know why. It's a whole other thing. But I told you this isn't about what they believed. It's about what they could not bring themselves to believe. There was one thing, and when you find out, it's, it is amazing. Take a look. The bottom of my message is all, all torn up. Look at chapter 19 again, and look at verse 23. And look at the first word. Oh. Isn't that emphatic? Oh. It starts out like somebody is awed. Oh, that my words were now written. Oh, that they were printed in a book. Do you know what they couldn't believe? They could believe that there was one God. They could believe that he made man out of clay and that put, placed him on the earth and that man goes back into the dust, but he's still going to see God in his flesh. They could believe there was, a, there was a flood. They could believe in a former age. They could believe in heaven. They could believe in hell. They could believe in a redeemer. They could not believe that God could have a book. You doubt me? Look at chapter 31. Keep your place here, but look at 31. Chapter 31. And it starts out with the same emphatic statement. Chapter 31. Look at verse 35. Oh, that one would hear me. Behold, my desire is that the Almighty would answer me and that mine adversary had written a book. Of all the things these guys could believe, you know what they could not believe? They could not believe that God could have a book. Isn't that crazy? Um, my wife, her dad was a farmer, a dairy farmer. And at some point, you just get to where the dairy farmer or the farm is too much. Uh, and when it got to be too much, uh, he was renting the farm, so he left that go. And he became a caretaker for a little cemetery. And if you could imagine, I don't think we have, you ever see just a, a, a window with four panels of glass? Okay, that's this cemetery. Think of it like a window with four panels. And the, this panel here, the one farthest back in the corner, was the original cemetery. So all the oldest graves are in that section. And then it has expanded out to the other three panes. 
Now, uh, again, I'm in another country, but we had a civil war, 18, 1860, 1864, we had a civil war. And a lot of men died. And when they died, they buried them and they did not put a gravestone, they put a headstone. There's a vast difference between a gravestone and a headstone. A gravestone lays over the grave. A headstone stands up at the head of the grave. You put that where the head of the person is buried. And in the 1860s in my country, you know what they used to build head, to make headstones? White limestone. You know why? If you can use the word stone and soft in the same sentence, it's white limestone. It's, it's soft stone. If you've got to chisel something, you want to do it in white limestone. And I would go back into that section, the oldest section. You could always tell the Civil War grave because it would stand up there white, white limestone. But the problem is because it is soft, the rain beats down on it and the wind blasts it with sand and it erodes. And I don't know if you, you, you surely there's somebody around here, I don't know if you guys ever used white limestone for headstones, but I would go back there and you could read the name of the guy, the person buried there. And you could pretty much get where they were born and died, uh, age, when they, you know, the year they were born and died. But in those days, they would put something else. And a lot of times it was in writing, in cursive. And you can't read that. You know why you can't read it? It's eroded. Too much has been washed off with rain and, and the wind. I can get the name, I can get the dates, but I can't read anything else. It's just a bunch of squiggly lines. Kind of like when I take off my glasses. 1992, I was in Scotland. I was preaching in Ireland, England, and Scotland. And a lot of castles in Scotland. And I'm standing outside a castle. Uh, you know, in, in this, in our country, I'm sorry, in our country, my country, the United States, a lot of times you have an old church. And right beside it is the church graveyard. People in the church die, they go to the graveyard. When they had a castle, right beside it was a graveyard. If you lived in a castle, they buried you in the graveyard. So I'm standing outside a castle in Scotland in 19... 19, 1992, I, they don't have headstones. They have gravestones. I'm talking five feet long, two feet wide, and they write a book. They give you the guy's name, the day he was born, the day he died. I mean, when he cut his teeth. They tell you everything. But it's laying flat. Guys, if, if it erodes when it's standing up and things are hitting it in a, what happens when it hits right on top of the guys? I am reading a gravestone. This is from 1100 AD, almost 400 years before Columbus ever sailed. And I am reading every word on that gravestone as clearly as if I was reading the pages of this book. I am not exaggerating. You know why? Because 1100 AD in Scotland, they were very scriptural. Look back to chapter 19, Job chapter 19. And look again at verse 23. Oh, that my words were now written. Oh, that they were printed in a book. Look at verse 24. That they were graven with an iron pen in lead in the rock forever. You know what they did in 1180 in, in Scotland? This guy would chisel all this out in this white limestone. And then he would melt lead. And he would take molten lead. You got these letters, they're beveled into this rock. And he would, he would fill every single letter with lead. And over the years, the lead, though it was gray when he put it in there, when it's exposed to the atmosphere, it turns black, black as ink. And because the rock was so, so eroded, I got down and looked. Guys, the lead was a quarter inch higher than the surface of the stone. A quarter inch of stone had eroded away, and I could still read it because they put the lead in the rock forever. Isn't that amazing? So here is these guys. They had so much that they believed, but they couldn't believe that God could have a book. Let me tell you about my wife's grandfather. Grandpa Albert, he was an old Methodist, got saved in an old Methodist camp meeting. And by the time I met, uh, by the time I started dating Kathy and I met Grandpa, he was in the beginning stages of dementia. Who knows, he may have lived long enough to become president. And every time I saw him, I knew him. I saw him eight or nine times. 
But for him, every time was the first time. Because he couldn't remember meeting me the last time. I understand. I'm not that memorable, I guess. Did you ever check anybody out? You ever see anybody like maybe reading the Bible? No! Reading the Bible. Mm -hmm. We believe it? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, I mean, you believe salvation by grace? Yeah. Charles Curry? You check them out? That's what Grandpa did with me. Every single time I'm, that, that I got with him was the first time he's checking me out. And I'll never forget this. This was like a Norman Rockwell painting. We are standing by the fence at the farm looking at the cows in the pasture talking about the Lord. Oh, I'm telling you, Grandpa didn't remember stuff, but he loved the Lord. And, and you can go on the internet and find a bunch of stuff about me, but I'll tell you something. I love the Lord. I really do. And so he's talking about the Lord, and I'm talking about the Lord. He's talking about the Lord, and I'm talking about the Lord. And finally, he stops, and he looks over, and he goes, Brother, you talk like a Christian. I said, Oh, yeah, Grandpa, I'm saved. And then it was okay. But he's checking me out. Here's what I want you to do. You're sitting on a, on a bench in a park, reading your Bible. Do you know I think you ought to do that? I think you ought to do that. I think you ought to go to a park, sit down on a bench, and read your Bible. Bible, not, not, a, not a, 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 ta a tablet, a Bible. You say, why? Why can't I read off a tablet? I'll, give you, I'll tell you why. Two guys sitting on a park bench, both of them reading off a tablet. One of them is reading the Bible. You want to tell me which one? But when you open that book up, I think the presence of that book has a calling effect on evil. I think it is just good for the world to see that book open. Don't read it because you think you're more righteous or more pious or you're a better person because you're not. But I think you just open up that book. And there's some, there's some, some devils go, okay, let's just back up a minute. So you're sitting, you're sitting on a park bench and Job sits down. And you know what he's going to do? He's going to check you out. Beautiful day, don't you think? Yeah, yeah, it sure is, Joe. You know, some people think this all happened by accident, but uh, I think there's a creator. Oh, yeah, Joe, he, there sure is. You believe that? Oh, I sure do. Yeah, absolutely. God created it. You think there's one God? Absolutely. Job made us out of clay. Yeah, he did. I just, yeah. Well, you know, I think there was a time when there was a flood covered everything. Yeah, Job, sure was. You believe that? I, I believe that, Job. You know, I think man needs a redeemer. And that redeemer is going to stand on this earth in latter days. Job, you got it nailed down. I mean, can you see this guy trying to check you out and you are passing this exam like you never did in school? And he finally says this. How do you, how'd you get this? How do you know this stuff? And you say, what's Job? I read the Bible. What's the Bible? Well, it's God's book. God doesn't have a book. Oh, he does, Job. Yes, he does. Can you imagine being the first person to take this book right here and put it in the hands of the man that believed so much of it before a word of it was written? Could you imagine handing this to Job? Job, Job, take a look at this. of God. He says, these are the words of God. Job, every one of them. All this came from God. Every word, Job. You must love this book. Oh, Job, I love that book. Do you believe everything this book says? Job, I believe that book. You must read this book every day. I believe that book. How much do you read it? Uh, I think that book came from God, Joe. Yeah, but I bet you read it all the time, don't you? I mean, to have the words of God 
in a book. You must read it all the time. Job, can I have my Bible back? How are you going to explain? How are you going to, how are you going to get it past Job, let alone God, that you believed every word in this book came from God and never read every word? I don't know what God's going to ask us to the judgment seat, but don't you think he might say, I sent you a book. Did you get it? Sure did, King James Bible. Okay. Did you read it? King James Bible. Hey, can I help you guys? Let me save you some time and some money. Don't buy my books. Now, I don't know how many times you have an author in your church and they want you to buy their books. Do not buy one book off that table. Do not read a book about a book that you're not going to read. Every book, the Bible says that if everything Jesus Christ did, the world could not contain the books was written down. This is the only book. Tell me if this does not describe the Bible. I say this, the Bible is the only book on the planet that does not come from the planet. This one comes from the planet. Saved author? Yeah. Believe the book? I sure do. But the only inspired words any of these books are where I quote this one. I have never written one inspired word. And if you tell me this, Gip, I bought your books, but I'm reading so much of the Bible, I have time to read your books. I'd say, praise the Lord. I had a guy tell me that. He got mad. I think you ought to read this, guys. I think you ought to read a proverb for the day and 10 pages. I did not say chapters. 10 pages of your Bible every day. Start, start at the beginning. Read to page 10. Next day, 20. Next day, page 30. Next page, day, page 40. And that will get you through your Bible three to three and a half times a year. You mean when I get done reading it? I have to read it again? Yeah, you know that book you love. You know that book you think came from God. Why do I have to keep reading the Bible? You know why you have to keep reading the Bible over and over and over and over? I'm going to tell you why. Because I like to kiss my wife. That's the reason. What do you mean? I like to kiss that lady. I told you, on the 12th of August, we're going to celebrate 52 years married. Married. I don't know how many times I've kissed that lady in 52 years, except not enough. I haven't kissed her yet, but I went, okay, time out. That is enough of that handshake for the duration. I like kissing her. Guys, there's things people like to do. There's, there's guys, and I don't, I don't mock people that like to play golf. I'm going to change a little, change a little ball around a call pastor. You want to do that? That's fine. I know guys pay $1,500 for one club. If I pay $1,500 for one club, it better play golf. <laughs> when I go, I rent the golf. I go, I rent the clubs. I rent the cart. I rent the balls. I would rent a golfer. Just go out, play 18 holes, and come back and tell me how much I enjoyed it. I know I'd enjoy it more, you doing it than me. Could you imagine a guy spending $1,500 per club? $10,000 a year to be a member of the country club? $4,000 for a cart. Oh, man, you don't play golf, don't you? Oh, man, I love to play golf. How many times did you play last year? Oh, man, I played once. Once? Why? Well, I don't want to become so heavenly minded. I'm of no earthly good. Anything you love to do, you love to do it. Fishermen like to go fish. Hunters like to go hunt. Golfers like to go golf. I like to eat. It's the only thing I can do that doesn't bite back. And we say we love this book. And then you're not going to read it. You know why? If you love something, you got to read it and read it and read it and read it and read it. And I think the Lord may say, I, I did. I, I, I said about reading 10 pages a day. i got to say this. One Sunday morning, I was preaching at church, and I said, you ought to read 10 pages a day. I came in for the Tuesday night service, and this guy comes up to me. He's angry. He's mad at me. I know that's hard to believe somebody could do that. He said, well... He said, I bought some of your books. And he said, now you've got me reading 10 pages of my Bible every day. I don't have time to read your books. And I said, what do I care? I said, you're getting what you need, and I got your money. <laughs> this is a wonderful partnership we have. Have you seen our table full of paperweights and doorstops? <laughs> if you tell me you bought my books and been reading your Bible so much you don't have time to read my books... I would probably put my conviction on dancing on hold for a few minutes. 
But if you tell me this, Gip, I bought your books, and I've been reading your stuff, I don't have time to read the Bible, I would say get rid of my books. I would. Get rid of anything you're reading before you read this. So what are you going to do? How, how are you going to explain it? You know what I think we are? And I'm going to say this. I want you to know what I'm about to say. I'm going to give you a great compliment. I'm not going to chop your legs up on you. I'm going to give you a great compliment. Let me tell you what I am. I know you don't have that kind of time. I'll use, I'll use good language. I'm a Baptist. Do you know why I'm a Baptist? I don't think Jesus was a Baptist. I don't think he started Baptist churches. I think Baptists are more right than anybody else. Don't you? I believe in salvation by grace. Well, there's other people who believe that. Okay. I believe salvation by grace and that once you're saved, you're eternally saved. Didn't we just lose some? I believe that you get baptized after you're saved. So I believe Baptist doctrine. I'm a Baptist, but I'm better than that. Because I'm not only a Baptist, I am an independent Baptist. I don't believe in a domination. Your pastor, Brother Friesen, I'll bet you nobody calls you in April and says, now, Pastor Friesen, Sunday is Earth Day, and so all of our churches are preaching about Mother Earth. I would like to be there when they tried that. <laughs> but nobody calls us. We are, every church is independent of the others. Nobody tells him what to say except God. Nobody tells him what, there's is Pastor Bishop, where are you? Okay, does anybody call you and tell you what to preach? Why? Not because you're Baptist, because you're independent Baptist. You're not a Southern Baptist. You're not an American Baptist. You're not a G A or C. We, so I believe in being a Baptist. I believe in being an independent Baptist. I go farther than that. I'm a King James Bible believing independent Baptist. I think we're more right than anybody. Do you understand? I'm not saying that in pride. If I didn't think that, I'd go join whoever I thought was more right. So I think we're more right. You could take me. I don't know where they are. But I'll bet every one of you could take me and show it to me. Could you take me right after service to a church in this area where they don't use the King James Bible and don't believe it? Could you show me one where they say, oh, yeah, they use the ESV in there. And they don't even read it. And they use the NIV in that one. And they don't even read it. That doesn't bother me at all. It doesn't bother me at all. I say, what do you mean? It doesn't bother me at all. They don't read it. You know why they don't read it? Because they don't believe every word that belongs there. That is the same reason I don't believe the book, uh, read the Book of Mormon. That is the same reason I don't read the Koran. I, I believe those rank right up there with the Hobbit. I, I believe this. If you read the Book of Mormon, I'll bet you would find some line in there that you would say, that's pretty smart. That's a good line. But it ain't inspired. You understand? You might find a line of wisdom in there. Uh, you, might, you might find in the Koran a line of wisdom. See Muslim with knife? Wrong! <laughs> But I don't read them because I don't think they're the Word of God. And these guys use ESV. They don't read it because they don't believe it's the Word of God. And the NIV, they don't read it because they don't believe the Word of God. You, you all claim, do you not all claim to, to be able to show me where every single Word of God is? Could you not say it is right here? i got to tell you this. I'm trying to get down. I want to let you go. But I want you to know something. There is, a, there is one square foot of magic. There's a magical spot in every single one of our churches. You know where it is? Right there. Right behind the pulpit is one 12 by 12 magic square. You say, why is it magic? Because when you stand on it, this book is perfect. I've heard so many preachers stand behind a pulpit and say, the Bible is the word of God without a mixture of air. Every word from God. Don't ever believe, don't ever buy and believe everything we say from a pulpit. Find out if we believe it down there. Because see, once they step off the magic square, the guy that just told you the book is perfect back there, ask him to show it to you and he can't even find it. Where's that book you were preaching about? Brother, it's out there. <laughs> well, get out there and get me a copy. I'll bet you, you ask him. I'll bet you ask him. I'll bet you ask him. You ask me. That book you're talking about is perfect. And you put it in my hand, I will put that one in your hand. Or I'll take Pastor Joe's and give you his permanently. You see what I'm saying? We believe the Bible is perfect word of God behind the pulpit, and we believe the Bible is perfect word of God in front of the pulpit, too. So I understand why people don't read the SV. They don't believe it's perfect. I understand why they don't read the NIV. They don't believe it's perfect. You guys claim to believe this book is every word and words of God, correct? So how do you explain you don't read it? How are you going to explain to the God? 
that wrote this book and gave it to you, and you people who are members of this church or any of these, these visiting churches here, of these pastors, God gave you a pastor that never got behind the pulpit and told you God made a mistake. I run a Bible college. I teach four classes. I correct my students' tests. You know why? No, not because I'm smarter than them. I do not correct my, my students' tests because I'm smarter than them. I've got a couple. They're going to leave me in their dust one of these days. Do you know why I correct their, their tests? Because I know more than they do. Give them about 30 years. I got, I got a guy, brother, this guy's a brainiac. I'm telling you, he's, he just graduated and he's teaching Hebrew and Greek. He's a brainiac. But I still more than, I know more than him. Oh, we might not go back and forth on Greek, but I, I know more. You understand? So when somebody gets up behind the pulpit and corrects this book, who are they claiming to know more of that? And I don't think anybody knows more than God. So here you bunch of people, you King James Bible thumpers, King James Bible believers, know exactly where every single word of God is. You're going to leave here tonight. Gripe that I got you out too late and go watch the leftover of your reality TV program and leave this thing sit. And you won't read it tomorrow, and you won't read it the next day, and you won't read it the next day. How can we, how can we defend that we act just like the ESV guys and the NIV guys? How can we, how can we explain that we believed every word? I, I say it this way. Here, here's, our, here's, our, here's our brave stand. But it's God. We're not like the crowd on the street. They, they use NIV, and they don't read it. Bless God, I believe the King James Bible is the word of God. And I don't read it. But if I'm going to ignore the word of God, I'm going to ignore the real word of God. Connoisseurs of neglect. Neglect the best. How do you explain to a guy named Job that you had every word that he never thought could be written? How do you explain to him? Do you think he'd be excited to see the Bible? I bet he'd be excited to see the Bible. And you explain, Job, I got the first copy when I was eight years old when my parents led me to Christ. I, I got, I'll bet some of you, I'll bet some of you got three or four Bibles home. And I'm, I'm not talking about different versions. I'm talking about the one your parents gave you. You got it in Sunday school and your parents gave you one for, we, we, got, we bought our boys a, a, a hardcover uh, old Schofield. And I said, you take care of that and I'll give you a soft, I'll, I'll buy you a soft cover. Man, I gave that, we gave that soft cover Schofield Bible to my middle son. He's a pastor today. He cried like a baby. He held that Bible to his chest. He said, the Bible. And he reads it every day. You believe it? If you believed it, wouldn't you read it? If you thought that the mind of God was produced on the pages of this book, is that what you believe? It is the word and words of God? Then how are you, you going to say, I just don't care to know what God thought? I want to make a big deal about it. I want to be better than somebody else. I want to be better than the NIV and ESV crowd. But I don't read it. I'd like you to stand with your heads bowed. I've got good news and bad news. With your heads bowed and your eyes closed. The good news is, don't worry. You will meet Job, but you're not going to have to convince him anything about the Bible. He's got it all sorted out by now, correct? So the good news is you're not going to have to explain to Job about not reading the Bible. Bad news? Forget Job. You're going to talk to the author of these words. You're going to talk to the author of this book. And how are you going to explain to him that I loved your words, I believed your words, I just never read your words. Many years ago, I was talking to a young man named Mike Mike was a King James Bible believer, but Mike did not think it was important to read the Bible. I said, Mike, do you believe every word in this book came from God? He said, I sure do. I said, have you read every word? He said, no. I said, Mike, do you understand based on your second answer, you're not qualified to give me your first one? Beware, people, you dare say every word in this book came from God when you haven't read every word. You don't know what you're saying amen to. I said, Mike, did you know that right in the middle of the Bible, it says Mike is an idiot? He said, it does not. I said, how do you know? You need to read that book, people. 
Yeah, I love Bible believers, but we better be Bible we better be Bible readers. I had a lady call me one time. She said, I believe the King James Bible is the Word of God. I get that a lot. She said, I used to believe the NIV. You know what changed me? I said, no. She said, I read my NIV. She said, I read my NIV three times cover to cover. It was like reading a newspaper. It was like a funeral. It was like the spirit of death. There was no life in that book. There was no power in that book. She said, after three times to the NIV, I said, there is something wrong here. And she said, I opened up a King James Bible and felt the spirit of God. That woman will testify against you. I met a young man. He was 31 years old. His name was Rusty. When he was 11, he had part of his brain removed because he had cancer. You would know. Am I okay? That's how he talked. And age 31, with part of his brain removed, he had read his King James Bible 11 times cover to cover. Oh my goodness. How are you going to explain to Rusty how you never read it? So I'm going to give a, I'm going to have a word of prayer and I'm going to give you an invitation. The invitation is not to come down here and promise God that you're going to read the Bible. You're either going to read it or you're not. And I'm not going to try to get you to promise anything to God that you're not going to do. Here's what the invitation is. Maybe down here, maybe where you are, kneeling at your chair, whatever you want to do. Maybe before we leave here, you just need to say this, Lord, I'm sorry for not reading your book. Could you just apologize to him once? Lord, all the trouble you went to, 40 different men, 1,500 years, bloodshed by the authors. I'm sorry that you went to all this trouble to give me this book that I make such a big deal about, but don't read. Could you guys one time before you leave here say, I am sorry for not reading your book. Then my advice is that after this day, read Read it any way you want. If you want to read two pages a day, fine. Three pages, five pages, 10, 20. I read 30 myself. Would you read it every day the rest of your life? Read it until you die or until you hear a real loud trumpet. Father, I thank you for this book. I don't doubt that these people are Bible believers. They will make a big deal about the fact that they're Bible believers. And I'm not going to call them liars or false witnesses or anything like that. But could you just kind of knock on their head a little bit and try to get them to rectify how they could believe every word in the book came from you, but it was not worth reading every word? Why would they not want to read every word you gave us? So what I pray tonight, I pray someone before they leave this room says to you, I am sorry for saying I believe a book that I don't read. I'm sorry for not reading your Bible. I hope somebody's, I hope you hear those words tonight, Lord. And then I pray for every person here. And if there's somebody here not reading the Bible, I'm not going to call them a name. I'm not going to call them a fraud. If there's somebody here that's saved and not reading the book, I pray they start reading the book. I pray they get every word read before you get back. I pray that they will, they will lay their eyes on every word of every page of this divine book. Help us, God, yes, to believe to be Bible believers, but help us, God, to be Bible readers. In Jesus Christ's name, I pray. Your heads bowed, your eyes closed, as piano plays. If you need to talk to the Lord, now would be the time. Lord, I am sorry for not reading your book.
Lord, thank you for what we've heard. God, breathe on us. Lord, I just pray that, our Lord, wherever you have dealt with any man, woman, or young person, Lord, about these things, Lord, that they would take it to heart and, and God, they would begin, Lord, tonight, Lord, to read your book. Lord, bless, Lord, we pray in all these lives, Lord, all these people that heard from you this night, Lord, we pray, may the seed not be stolen from their hearts. In Jesus' name, amen. You're dismissed.